Hi all, um, my name is Megan and I'm the TA for Pat's class this semester. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce Martha Neighbor. Um, she is a retired ECE instructor from KVCC um, and until recently was the chair of the early childhood department there. Um, along with that, she is a mother and a grandmother. Um, she's been a foster and adoptive parent um, and she has run an adoptive agency and led various um, committees around the state. So she has a wealth of knowledge regarding early childhood development and will be talking with us um, mostly today about the importance of bonding and attachment. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Thanks. And welcome to all of you out there. I understand from Megan that there might be about 20 of you or so. Um, and um, she mentioned several of the things in my background that I think are um, valuable experiences to talk about bonding, attachment. I'm expanding that a little bit to include foster care, adoption, um, children with special needs, uh, and sometimes it's the foster care and the adoption that creates those special needs. Sometimes they are children with special needs who then go on into foster care and adoption. Um, I'm going to read some books to you. I love children's literature. And I have some books that are really um, significant ways that we can say to children, we are attached to them. Uh, and what I'd like to do is start with a question that already came to uh, me through Blackboard from a young woman, Sarah, who works in the Rockland area. And the question was, um, and I'll read some of her words. I work in a child care setting as well as a public school as a sub. I have coworkers that tell me all the time, quote, we don't have time to hold certain children and they would rather see them cry and fuss than pick them up. What are suggestions for the child and also some non-confrontational words that I can share to express the importance of being held? So I want you to hold that question that Sarah has brought up for a little bit. And just think in terms of children that you might engage with on some, in some setting. Um, and this, these children actually were six weeks to 22 months. So again, young children. So we'll talk about things like holding children, um, some of the techniques to use to build attachment and strong relationships. Because we know more and more about how significant building relationships is with children when they're young, which helps them cope with just living, growing up, developing in a world that isn't always necessarily supportive. And what do they have to have internally, an understanding of who they are and relationships to make their way in the world. So that's kind of what we're going to be doing and I really appreciate Sarah asking the question if others of you out there have questions I'd encourage you to call in we can interrupt whatever we're talking about at the moment um, but if you have a particular question related to any of this I'd really urge you to call in um, I've done this lecture for Pat several times and have for many years um, done early childhood teaching so I'm really comfortable with um, the subject, but also just having discussions. So however you can make it useful for you, I would urge you to do that because it's your learning experience. Um, I would like to start with a little bit of background from early childhood, just to lay a couple foundational concepts that we are going to lay on top of that bonding, attachment, and, and so forth. So if you have a paper and pen there, or writing implement, you might have a crayon, I don't know. Um, I would urge you to write, make a, a diagram that looks like a set of stairs. So here are my stairs, and I'm just going to number these so that as I talk about it, then we'll have some frame of reference. So what this represents is stages of development. Now, you can use this, this 
diagram and this notion of stages of development for a whole stage of development or for an individual task. Like, we could say the baby has to crawl before they can stand up, before they take those first tentative steps, before they walk. You could add many, many more steps. Um, one time I read an article that said there are 19 stages of block building. So you could have 19 steps on your stages of development if you wanted to. So it's just a figure to think in terms of development happens in a certain order, it's predictable, it's orderly and sequential, and it doesn't matter whether it is attachment, whether it is walking, whether it's writing their names, whether it's building friendships. Development happens in these stages. And the child doesn't do that development in isolation. That child is in a family. We'll assume that there is a family there, um, a, within which that child is, is growing. And what happens is, so this child is crawling. We'll use that, that um, developmental test. So the child's crawling, 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 and somebody is there, and they say, oh, come see me, and the child crawls to them. And when they've done enough of crawling, then they pull themselves up. They're ready for step two stage two in this crawling business moving toward walking. So they pull themselves up and they practice and practice and practice that on the coffee table and the, the um, couch and on the kitchen cabinet, on the chairs, whatever. Um, and when they fall over, somebody is there. And somebody picks them up maybe and gives them a hug and a kiss. And what it does is it says to the child, oh, okay, I'm not alone in the world, and I have some support, so when I've done that pulling up enough, I can take a step. And I practice that over and over and over, and this repeats itself for every single skill that we have, is these stages of development happen because we have support to finish step one or stage one before we move on and before we move on and before we move on. So one of the challenges for some children is that the family, for whatever reason, develops a hole, a gap. I'm just going to make like an X right down here because this is our family. This is our foundation. And so this child is practicing pulling or taking those first steps because we've had crawling, pulling up, now we're on taking those first steps. The family has fallen apart for some reason. In a temporary way, uh, one of the parents is in the hospital. Uh, one of the parents has had to go to a different town to get a job. Um, they're moving. They, um, any kind of trauma can cause that for a child. The parents are separated. Um, it could be anything. A new child comes into the family and that can seem like a trauma for an existing child. So when this child is trying to take those steps, the foundation is broken. And so their development falls through the, the base. There isn't that reassurance that I'm going to be here for you because the adults are not there for them, and they get stuck. This is when development can get stuck. And what we can see sometimes is regression. The child kind of loses that latest development and moves back. So it, it calls to mind Sarah's question about children fussing and should they be held. Maybe that's what they need at that time. But it's until a patch can be put on that family, whether it's they move into their new home or their new apartment or their new wherever living, ex living situation, and things stabilize, and we can put a big patch on there, and then the child can go back 
and finish off this stage of development and then move on to walking more comfortably. So a child who already has a special needs, whether it's been diagnosed or not, you can see how that can also impact moving through those stages. And sometimes it impacts the parents so that they can't provide that foundation for children. And so they, they don't know how, or they are unable, or they're unskilled um, in helping that child with a special need. But it's, it's going to happen anytime children encounter a situation where that foundation has that breach. But it can be repaired. Sometimes people think children who go into foster care, their family has had some kind of a serious breach or they wouldn't have gone into foster care. The, the law says and the social workers are careful, I think most of the time, to um, keep children at home, put in services, work to keep the children in that home, which is the best resolution if they can do that. But if children go into foster care, there's a, one of those breaches in their family. So they have to work in a new family, in a new foster family, um, to put those pieces back together again, and we'll talk about that with the attachment piece, before they can continue on in development. So this, this notion of stages being orderly and sequential, every task, no matter what it is we learn, has stages of development, and they're predictable. You look at any child development book, and you can read about what these stages are. They have charts, they have all sorts of those things that are available for you to look at. But any of those situations that are trauma, trauma in, and you can name it in all different ways, but trauma is going to cause that breach and a patch needs to be put on so children can move forward in their development. You may know some adults who seem to be stuck in childhood stages, and maybe that patch was never put on for them. You know, I have a belief that lots of folks whose residence is the main state prison didn't have that patch put on and didn't learn adult skills then. And so they stayed stuck in behaviors and beliefs that are childlike, childish, childlike. And so when you're an adult, the law says you can't take something that doesn't belong to you. You can't hurt somebody because they got in your way. You can't do those things. But they didn't learn that back in childhood. So that's another whole lecture about something very different. But I think this is instructive in thinking about um, bonding and attachment and children and development and all that. So that's background piece number one. Background piece number two is typically the terms bonding and attachment are set together and people think of it as kind of one thing and not necessarily why do we have two terms for it. Um, and many, many years ago, I'm sure, 15 years ago anyway, I attended a conference, an adoption conference down in Massachusetts, and there was a social worker, uh, an aged gentleman, he was probably 80 at that time, and he had for many years been a social worker in Chicago in the foster care system, and then helping children and families transition from foster care families to adoptive families. So he was helping them understand new roles, both as the children and the families. So part of what his work was, his research was, was related to understanding this difference. So he could then use the information and his beliefs about bonding and attachment to train these transitioning families from foster care to adoption. So, Ken, I, um, 
Ken came up with a way to look at bonding and attachment as two distinct processes, processes, I guess. And he said that there are, in his understanding anyway, four kinds of bonding that happen for us, can happen for us. The first one is genetic. We have a bond with our genetic parents mother, father. We get our gene system, our, um, that whole thing, from them. And so that's how one way that we are always connected. So if you think of children who are not being raised by their genetic parents, already there is a loss for them. And when Elizabeth said to me, um, where does my curly hair come from? We have two daughters by adoption, Elizabeth and Emily. I said, well, you must get it from your birth mother. She looks at me and says, yeah, you have to have a permanent. So it was like, oh, right. But we didn't know that. We, it could have been her birth father instead of her birth mother. So there's that loss of factual kind of information, but we would attribute it characteristics that she brought, or how she was, to her birth parents. To this day, she does not know her birth father. We met her birth mother when Elizabeth was eight, and it answered a lot of questions. And one of the, the connections that she felt to her birth mother was, um, she, because she was eight, she was able to process this experience of meeting her birth mom. And she said, I know now I will never be a pencil. And I said, what do, you, what do you mean, Elizabeth? She goes, you know, tall and skinny. Her birth mom was tall, but had a big bone structure. She was a large woman. Um, and Elizabeth said, I bet that's what I'll look like. So she, there was that connection with her birth mother because she saw her, and her body structure is, she could be a younger sister to her birth mother. She looked, they look very, very similar. So there is this bond that we have with our genetic parents. So again, remembering, th as kids develop, they're gonna be asking questions, and if they're not growing up with their families of origin, then there are gonna be questions about genetics, and where did I get this, and why do I like this, and sometimes a child in an adoptive family will feel out of sync with that family, because they like music, and nobody else in the family does, or they're really skilled at athletics, and everybody else in the family is not, or doesn't have an interest in that. So sometimes there's a little um, disconnect there. So Ken talked about that first, and we can't deny it, it just is, that's the way it is. The second type of bond he talks about that we have is a birth bond with our mothers. Because of the shared time during the pregnancy and the birthing. And it is a connection with a person that is different than anybody else. It can't be recreated, it just is. And it's there. And I remember thinking our daughters were, were very young when they came to us. And I thought, well, they, they didn't never have any questions. They never, I mean, why would they? They were just so little. But they did. It was, I mean, just lots of things they wanted to know about who their birth parents were and that kind of stuff. They shared that experience. So it is. And as Ken was talking about this, he was saying, the thing to remember is it's not good or bad. It just is. It's not better or worse. It's just the way it is. Um, so as an adoptive parent, I can't expect to have either genetic or birth bonds with my daughters because I wasn't involved in either one of those things. Um, the third type of bond is called traumatic. And a traumatic bond is when persons, children, adults, are in a traumatic situation together and they share that experience and there's a connection that forms with people 
that doesn't go away. Um, many years ago now, 15 years ago now, I was doing this lecture actually at KVCC and it was 9-11. And someone came into the classroom and said, we have to go down to see what's happening. And so we all trooped down. And you saw the, the people pouring out of the towers, the people that were able to, to get out. And we know that that was a traumatic event to survive. And those people have a shared event. I could watch it on television. The rest of the country could. We didn't share that in the same way that those people did coming out. I know that there's a summer camp that um, was established here in Maine for families who lost someone in 9-11. Um, I have a friend whose sister was a public school teacher on Long Island. They had 95 children in that one school who had lost a family member. Traumatic experience for all those children and for those teachers who knew those families. So when people survive traumatic experiences together, there's a bond. Even now, you can talk about, well, how many days did you, were you out of electricity during the big ice storm? Now, some of you here are too young to remember that, but I remember that, and I was right in town Waterville, and it was eight days. Eight days, yeah. I mean, it was like, that was a traumatic event that we as a state experienced, and people connected with each other through the radio and through all sorts of ways that they would not necessarily have done had they not shared that traumatic experience. Sometimes children have been in a traumatic experience together if they were in a family with abuse and they survived that. Um, I think of the, the people in the boats coming from Africa, from some of those countries on those boats, and then the boats either capsize or some people drown, or the, the children coming across the border from Mexico or from Central America and Mexico, uh, they've all shared those traumatic events, and they are connected in a way that that's unique. The last one he talked about was, and he said that there would be some who would question this, this word, his use of the word transference. What he was talking about was, um, though he acknowledged there would be this conflict maybe, um, transference is when you meet someone and something clicks and you think, oh my gosh, this is like my long lost sister, or you become instant friends, or um, the, the phrase, people fall in love at first sight. It's this connection. He said, I didn't know what else to call it, so that's why he called it this. But there is a connection that is made that is unique. That, you, that people know happens, they can identify when it happened. I was a foster care liaison many years ago, working um, between foster families in the state of Maine and the Department of Health and Human Services as a liaison and working on challenges in the foster care system and that kind of stuff. In that capacity, I went to a foster home for a support group because they had support groups all around the state. And the foster mom said, oh, we have a new foster baby. And if everybody's OK with that, I'll bring her out and you know, just pass her around. We were waiting. We had adopted Elizabeth already. We were waiting for baby brother. We, we had talked about baby brother. We had applied again. We were in the waiting process. The home study was done. We were waiting for baby brother. So. Um, and she had said to me, oh, maybe you want to adopt this baby. I said, no, because it's a girl, not a boy. But you can almost predict the end of this story. And so we, she brings this baby out, and we're all passing her around. And I remember holding her, this baby who is now 31. Um, and it was just like, oh, my gosh, this is my baby. It, I remember that. It was this kind of weird feeling in my stomach. like I, I don't know how else to describe it. And Emily and I, that was our second daughter, we ended up being the family that they decided could parent her. Emily and I have a different closeness than her sister and I, who are very close, but it's a different one. 
And I attribute it to this, or that gives me a name of how to describe it. So it's like, oh, okay, I know what that means, for me anyway. So Ken talks about these four ways of bonding. Now, in, um, and I'm, I'm going to have Megan send a link to all of you because we don't, we aren't sure that you've gotten it. Pat had sent me a link to a journal, kind of like a magazine thing, that came from the University of Minnesota. And it talked about bonding and attachment and the differentiation of those two experiences, and we'll get to attachment in a minute. And one of the things that it talked about is bonding for parents is at birth. So this is a birth experience both for children and for parents. And it is an experience only for adults because babies can't do it. Their brains are not developed enough. Their senses are not developed enough. They have no experience about relationships yet. And so it's an adult experience. I brought a couple pictures. Um, I have a granddaughter who is now nine. And I hope you can see this. Yes, this was one of Grammy's um, um, scrapbooks that I made. This is Penelope when she was about two hours, maybe three hours old. This is our daughter, Elizabeth. They are just gazing at each other. And we know that infants can see about 10 inches. So they are clearly within 10 inches. Now down here, here is Elizabeth again and Penelope just gazing at each other. And Elizabeth, I remember, was saying, you know, who are you? And, and how are you going to be? Um, this, our family and Elizabeth and her um, husband had a, a child before this who died of heart disease. So this is a new kind of beginning for them. But this picture for me and this picture of those eyes just gazing at each other, that's bonding happening. And I felt so privileged to see it. This page is the three of us who are right there, our other daughter, Emily, my husband, Don, and me, getting to know her again within hours of her birth. And for us, it was getting to know a new grandchild. So we were doing it, but we had a different experience than her mother had with that. Our relationship was different. And the, the last picture of Penelope, anyway, is this picture, which was that afternoon, um, Elizabeth, because of, of her issues, kept Penelope in bed with her, and the hospital was okay with that. This is me, and I was talking to her about the relationship that we were going to build. I, I wanted her to hear the sound of my voice. I wanted her to see me as close as she could. She had no idea who I was, but it was important for me as an adult to say to her, I'm your Grammy, and we're going to spend a lot of time together. Um, and we always have. I go now to uh, Westbrook once a week where they live and volunteer in her school classroom and have done that for a long time so that I know what her everyday life is like too, not just those Grammy visits. But it was that connection that I wanted to start forming, which is the attachment part, but it started right from the very, very beginning um, for me because I was conscious of building an attachment. Now, in Ken's words, to get back to Ken Watson, attachment is an ongoing relationship under our control, our being each individual, the child, the adult, the two adults, the children. Um, we choose to attach 
and or disengage. And if you think of any breakup, a couple breaks up, a family breaks up, that's choosing to disengage. And it's fully under our control. Bonding, there's no choice. That happens. But attachment is fully under our control. And people don't think about it that way. It's really significant to think in terms of if you are a social worker, if you are a child care provider, if you are a teacher, if you are anybody with children, a parent, we choose to engage with children. And when in the years that we were foster parents, people would say, well, I couldn't do that because I'd get too close to them and then they'd leave. And I remember saying, that's what they need us to do is to get close to them so that they have an experience of attachment because maybe they haven't had it before. And it's really important to think as adults and to, to think back to Sarah's question. One of the ways that we attach to each other is spending time together and being close physically. So if you have a child between six weeks and 22 months who's fussing, there's some need there. They're expressing a need. And we'll look at the attachment cycle in just a minute. But to think in terms of, okay, what is the child learning about relationships if I don't pick him or her up? What is it saying about my choice to engage or be disengaged? So it's an ongoing relationship, totally under our control, where this, we have no control over, that just happens. But attachment, is under our control. And a piece that was not in any of those articles that Pat had were kind of five tasks, five things that can build attachment. So first, I'm going to look at that attachment cycle. So if you draw a big circle on your paper, if you're taking notes, here is a child with a need. So here are these children that Sarah's talked about who are fussing. And fussing is a communication method for children who don't have language yet. So something, they need something. So there's a child with a need. And there's an expression of the need. And it could be this fussing. It could be crying. It could be arms reached up. It could be sign language. It could be a word. It could be a behavior that says, I need a hug, or I want to be cuddled, or whatever. Um, the more you're around children, you'll recognize what their behaviors are telling you, uh, what the sound of the cry is. People say, oh yeah, I know that's a hungry cry, or that's a, I'm a wet cry, or whatever. Um, so there is an expression of the need. Then it is heard by someone. So they express that need. It's heard by someone. Now, if the need is met, if this someone goes on and meets that need, then the child can relax. And when we relax, we go, okay, all right. And there are two lessons learned by this experience. The experience says, I am worthy of care. Now, an infant cannot articulate that, obviously, and young kids can't either. But they relax because the need is met, and they go, oh, okay, somebody out there heard me, and I'm okay. I'm warm, I'm dry, I'm fed, I'm held close, I'm not abandoned in the world. And we know that abandonment is the most difficult experience for a child. Um, 
of all the things that can happen to children. Being abandoned is the ultimate because it says, I'm not worthy of any care. Nobody is out there to take care of my needs. I can't count on anybody. The second lesson learned is adults can be trusted to meet my needs. And I use the term adults because hopefully that's who's around when there are babies around. Babies, for the first six months, are not learning this. They're just soaking in all these experiences, which then give them data to make that judgment about, oh, I'm worthy of care, and I can trust these people around me. So some of those adults, hopefully, are parents, could be grandparents, could be care providers, could be a nanny, could be a child care provider, could be the lady next door, the person next door, um, could be an early head start with staff. There are adults who are responsible for meeting these needs, for answering these needs. So if you think in terms of child care, for example, if the child is in a quality child care, their needs are going to be met. There's more chance of that than if it is overcrowded, if they are put in a line of high chairs to keep them contained and out of the way. That's not quality childcare. And their needs are not going to be met because people don't even know what they are. They're just lined up. Um, but if it's quality care, we know that the outcomes are fine. And children can attach to more than one adult. So sometimes parents are worried that children are going to love the child care provider more than they love them. And that's an anxiety for parents because the child actually spends more hours with the child care provider than with the parents because the parents are working and they have long days maybe. But we know that children can distinguish between people when they start to be around six or seven months old. And we know that because when they get to be eight or nine months old, then that stranger anxiety happens. And it's like, wait a minute, you're not part of my care system. So this is what sets up positive, secure attachments. And it's those secure attachments that set children up for positive development as they move through all the stages. If we go back to our picture of the stages of development, and here is our family with the trauma happening. When the trauma happens, that, that meeting of needs doesn't necessarily happen because the adults are involved in whatever that trauma is. So then children are left kind of on their own, and they can't do it on their own. So that's why they fall through that base of security for development because there's nobody to support them there's, they don't know who's coming or going and one of the things that can happen is in a child care setting and whether it's foster care or it's child care on a day-to-day -day basis sometimes parents because of finances because of jobs because of moving they have to change child care and they think, oh, the baby or the young child is so young, that, you know, they'll be fine. They'll get adjusted. But in the meantime, the child is traumatized by not knowing who's going to be here, who's going to take care of me. If you think of visiting a friend as an adult and you use their bathroom and you get in there and you, use, you do what you need to do and you find there's no toilet tissue, I mean, it's a really concrete example, and it's like, oh, what do I do? Do I look under the vanity? Do I just hope for the best and, you know, don't have any toilet tissue? Do you hobble over to the door and say, excuse me? It's, it's thinking about that's an awkward situation for us as adults. What is it like if you're a child and you don't have 
the skills that we do as adults, never mind where the toilet tissue is, it's who's going to feed me? Who's going to put me to bed? Am I going to like it if this person pats my back? Are they going to jiggle me the way that I like to be jiggled as a baby? Some people go side to side or back to front, and it's like, ooh, they don't even know who I am. So how am I going to get my needs met so that I feel that I'm worthy of care and that these adults can be trusted to meet my needs? So it's thinking in terms of, okay, if we can do this for young children, so six months plus, they can feel this, because they've had enough experiences, this attachment, and by, we hope, by one, one hour, one year, um, Eric Erickson talks about basic trust. Hopefully, it's happened. This is basic trust. Trust in self, trust in others to meet their needs. So if we have children who, I'm just drawing the same circle, here's the need, here's the expression, here's the heard by, and in the, the previous one, the circle went to need met, need unmet, what happens is if the need is unmet, it pushes the child down here into meet own need, needs. The need is not met. The child doesn't relax. The child doesn't learn those two messages. So this is disrupted attachment. It doesn't mean that it can't happen, but it means that it's been disrupted. And that something needs to happen to kick this back up into this cycle of a met need so the child can relax and express that need again. What happens if we keep saying we have a need, we keep crying, and nobody hears it, we stop crying? It's effort. It takes effort to cry. And if nobody's going to come and nobody's going to meet our need, we're not going to keep doing that anymore. Children who experience abuse don't cry. And people in foster care say, oh, I had this baby come, and this baby is so good. She never cries. Well, when you think back to what was her experience prior to coming into that foster home, crying got her nothing. Maybe got slapped maybe got hurt. You read about it in the newspaper. Adults who lose control when they're angry or frustrated shake a baby, the shaken baby syndrome, the babies who have broken limbs, who have a skull fracture, those are babies who were hurt because they were crying or the adults didn't have anger management skills. So you want the baby then to get into a cycle of, okay, it's okay. It's okay for me to cry, to express my needs, because that's how I'm going to learn that I'm worthy and that you can be trusted to meet my needs. So I hope that has made sense so far. So we've got our typical attachment cycle and a cycle that says, Hmm, something needs to happen here. And in the material or the article that um, Megan will forward to you, it talks about um, the, the one thing that um, parents need to develop is responding sensitively. And I just wanted to read one paragraph. No parent can or should jump at every little signal that the baby gives. But the child's overall experience should be that her signals are effective in getting a response, that caregivers are available and willing to respond. In order to respond sensitively, 
a parent must understand the cues and the signals, so that expression of the child, be willing to respond and have the emotional strength and social support necessary to sustain sensitivity over time. So it's that willingness to listen and to get up when you're really, really tired. And when we were doing adoption work and adoption training, we would talk to adop prospective adoptive parents about the fact that their children may have had an attachment to other caregivers in an orphanage overseas or to foster parents, and they needed to work almost extra hard to get that attachment transferred to them. They were newcomers on the scene. The child might, been, might have been six or eight months, could have been a year or two. They needed to really work on that attachment cycle. So we would say, if the child makes any sound, respond to it. So they know that even a little cry gets a response. You can always back off from that and say, you'll have to wait a minute, I'm here, but I'm gonna finish doing whatever this is and then I'll be in. But it's thinking about what is the past taught the child, so what is the present right now and what do I need to do? But that parenting sensitivity is what's really important. There are several forms of insensitive parenting. One is persistent chronic failure to respond to the infant's cries and other bids for attention, an especially harmful form of insensitivity. And sometimes this comes if the um, mother is home with the baby and has postpartum depression. They are almost immobilized sometimes, and so they don't respond at all. The long-term effects of emotional unresponsiveness include anxious avoidant attachment, declining intellectual functioning, and are often serious behavior problems. So you think then of declining intellectual functioning, check the box for special need. Serious behavior problems, check the box for, for special need. Those are children who are gonna need other supports in life. Insensitivity also may be inconsistent, erratic patterns of responding to the infant. So sometimes the baby cries, and somebody responds, sometimes they don't. Babies who are responded to consistently in research have actually been found to cry less because they know when they do cry, somebody will come. So people say, oh, well, I'm not gonna respond every time they cry. Well, you're gonna get that more frequent crying if you don't respond. Um, or it may be intrusiveness, and I think sometimes this can happen, particularly if there's an extended family room, which is a failure to respect the child's signals that say, I don't feel like playing or eating or being tickled or kissed right now. Lots of people kind of coming in, not listening to those cues that the baby is giving, like, just let me go to sleep. Years ago, I did just uh, I had a friend, and, and uh, I said, why don't you and your husband go out? I'll take care of your little one. And he was raised by two parents who spoke Spanish. Um, and so the child, though he was probably 18 months, maybe two, maybe two years old, I don't remember now, but anyway, he was saying something to me and I didn't get it. And I said, we're gonna read a book. I knew it was getting ready for bedtime and we'll sit and read this book. And he kept saying this thing. And finally I said, oh, say it again. And he said, tired boy tired boy. I was totally missing his words for just put me to bed. And he was crying and fussing and I thought, well, his parents had not been out and tired boy. I missed the cue. And so he was fussing. And so it's thinking about not being too intrusive. Insensitivity does not imply bad intentions on the part of the adult, but may result from inaccurate knowledge, erroneous beliefs, stress and exhaustion, or emotional issues that render the caregiver unable to be available for the child. So thinking about our response is teaching something, or our lack of response is teaching something to that child. So what is the message that he or she is getting um, from our behavior? So I just really like that section. Questions, Megan? Can I ask a specific question about um, that? brings me to often um, parents or caregivers who do respond to crying baby, a baby who's 
um, between two to six to eight months old. They physically respond, but what I hear a lot of times is, you're okay, you're fine, you know, and, and uh, minimizing the extent that the child is feeling. That mixed message is that just as impactful and negatively as, as not responding at all, or is it not? How does that fit in? I guess that language, um, the language probably can't be processed at two to four to six months. They won't get that. They will get the tone of the voice, but it sets up a pattern of language that I don't think is helpful as children get older and are able to understand those words because they're not okay. They're not fine. There's some reason that they are fussing or crying because that's the language they have. That's all that they can say. It evolves into, well, use your words. Well, they don't have the words sometimes when they were a three or four year old. And it does. It gives them a different message that it's not okay to feel anxious or to feel afraid or to feel just agitated. And I totally believe in naming what you're seeing. It looks like you're really frustrated. It looks like you are telling me, or you can ask that question. I remember when I taught a year up at Farmington, at University of Maine at Farmington, we had a little 18-month-old in an infant-toddler playgroup, and he was hitting kids, and he would grab things, and the students were getting baffled. They were baffled as to, what do we say to him? And I said, well, then we talk to him and say, what is it you're trying to tell us? And that statement or that question can be a way for children to know it's okay, and an infant isn't going to give you an answer, but what are you trying to tell us? Do you want me to pick you up? If they don't want you to pick them up, they'll squirm or they'll get stiff. It's like, oh, okay, I guess I guess that wrong. Do you need a dry diaper? And if you try those things that are typical, something may work. The other thing to remember about young infants is they don't have a memory of these experiences until they're six or eight months old. And I mean, if they were abused, they're going to have that in their brain. But just ordinarily, ordinary interactions. And so they give us a lot of credit for trying. And if you make a mistake today, it's OK. They don't hold it against you. They don't hold grudges. And so you try. And that's when that sensitivity comes in. And I don't, I, I would agree with you, Megan, I don't think that that kind of language gives children the cues that say, it's okay to be angry, to be frustrated, to be, because we think, well, they're angry or they're happy. And yes, maybe those are what they're expressing, but we can use language to honor that or to use words like frustration or agitation or if you're curious or whatever, to build language that will describe emotional experiences. Because, and I see this in, um, when I was doing practicum site visits this last semester, I taught a course at KV. And I would hear caregivers, particularly in preschool, saying to kids, you're fine, you're fine. Well, they weren't fine. I would say into my breath, what do you think? Why are they crying? They're not fine. Something has prompted them to cry because that's just not a typical response to playing at the Play-Doh table or whatever. Something has happened. And sometimes I think it's, as um, Sarah was saying, they would rather see them cry and fuss. But why? What does that teach them about us as adults? And it doesn't build that vocabulary of emotions. And so I would agree with you. I, I don't think that's good use of language. Yes? Wouldn't overstimulating as far as every time they do cry, you jump to, wouldn't that overstimulate them to kind of expect it? Well, um, if you think back to just a minute ago, we were talking about they have a need, so they cry. So then, and, and you don't have to rush to that crib and, and pick them up immediately. We can take time and say, oh, what are you trying to tell me? And they're getting a response, and they know you're there. 
And that research says if we respond, they will actually cry less. People worry about getting spoiled babies. Spoiling can happen only when children can make the distinction between a need and a want. A need is something I need. And particularly an infant, they, they just have needs. They don't have wants. If we think of association as a need, I want to be cuddled. That's a need. That's not a want. That's I need to know that there's somebody else in the world who cares about me. And so by responding to that, and maybe it is the baby just wants another couple pats on the back because they're stirring in the night and they're fussing and you go in and you pat them on the back and they go right back to sleep. That then gives you a little more sleep too, <laughs> puts them back to sleep. But it's thinking about the fact that they operate on needs. But as children get to be two, three, depends on the child, but they then have wants. I want a cookie now. And if I say, okay, fine, and I give you a cookie, then every time you say cookie, I'm reinforcing a behavior that I don't necessarily want to have happen all the time. That's when I would call it spoiling. And that's a different whole thing, because that's what the child wants. I want that toy right now. Well, as we learn social relations, you might not get it right now. We can have a conversation about compromise and mediation and that kind of stuff at a pretty young age. But if I always give you what you want, you're going to believe that I deserve everything I want immediately. That's a child, in my definition, who is a spoiled child. But if it's a need, and you can, as kids get a little older, you can say, do you want that or do you need that? And they'll go, oh. Because if you've used that language and that approach, they can sort out, I need it or I want it. I don't know. You'd, you'd have to know from history of interaction with them. And if it's getting toward supper time and you're not quite finished with making that meal, but they are hungry. They could very well be hungry because they had a snack at 3 and now it's 6. They might be crying for a cookie and you say, well, I can set you at the table and give you some crackers and milk because they need that even though you might think they're saying, I want a cookie. Well, I won't give you that, but I will give you this. You're responding to a need. It sounds like you need some food and supper's gonna be late. So you're taking that within the context of this. And you'll have, I mean, if you had a child and, and you were responding, and our, a lot of our adoptive parents experience this, um, and we were doing this training around responding to children every time they even murmured because you want them to murmur to you. And they would call the agency, the adoption agency, and say, my mother just said, I'm going to spoil this baby and I'm going to have a monster on my hands. And we'd say, remind grandma that the child needs to respond to you and needs to know that you will respond to them. And it's okay, you're not going to have a spoiled brat of a child, basically. Because that is the fear. That's the belief. That's an old belief that you could spoil kids very, very young. We know cognitively they don't have that. They just don't. They, they can't figure out. Because spoiling or being spoiled is really manipulative. And they will ask you for things at inopportune times because they know you'd give it to them because you don't want a scene or a temper tantrum or something like that. No. They can't do that because they, their brains cannot think in that way. Like the cutoff? Like well, the it's not a cutoff. Yeah, yeah. It, it depends on how, how bright they are, how, where they are in the development of cognitive skills, and how much you've talked to them, and how much you have said, oh wow, it looks like you really need a snack about now. You can tell when kids are getting hungry. 
And when you say, it looks like you need something, you're using that language. And if they've just had supper, and you know their bellies are full, then, and then they ask you for something else, you can say, well, your body doesn't need that right now. You may want it because you saw the cookies on the counter, but we're not offering cookies right now. And with the foster children that we had, food was an issue a lot of the time because they had not had enough food. And so we would say to them at the end of each meal, has your body had what it needs? Have you had enough to eat? And one time, one of the, we had a couple brothers, and one of them said, you ask me that every single time. I said, I want you to know that there's always enough food here. When they came home from school, the first thing they got was a snack. They had dinner. They, I mean, it was, we were deliberate about that because they needed to know that their bodies needed food, and there was always going to be food. Um, once I remember one of them, the younger of them, um, who's now a man in his probably 40s, but um, we were at a barbecue, and my husband and I just decided we weren't going to limit what the kids ate or anything. And he ate and ate and ate and ate, and then went and threw up. And then we had an opportunity to talk about what did it feel like in your body because kids who have experienced abuse sometimes kind of shut off the feeling from the neck down so he didn't even connect that. Oh, so we used it as one of those learning opportunities. Um, the, the first two little girls we had, they were five and six sisters and had been in a very neglectful situation. They would eat more than we would at a meal until they learned that lesson that, oh, there's another meal coming. There's a snack coming. But it, it had to be learned to cover up that old lesson about, I better eat it now because I might not have any more. Um, so it's thinking about the history and where are they right now. Um, does that answer your question? I'll give you more to think about. Yeah, yeah. good, good. If there are any other questions out there, feel free to call in and um, add to our discussion here. So I'd like to look at this question a little bit more about Sarah and the children who are six weeks to 22 months. And to think in terms of we don't have time to hold certain children. So one of my first questions is the certain children. So it doesn't sound like it's all the children. But maybe there are children who, who fuss more, cry and fuss more. So then I'd ask, OK, why do they cry and fuss more? And is it the younger children? Is it the older children? To think in terms of secure attachments, children who have a secure attachment then feel as if they can go off on their own a little bit. and they look at you and check it out and you smile to them and they go off. They're not going to be fussing and crying in the same way that maybe an infant is who can't move yet or is frustrated because they can't quite get that crawl going. Um, and think about other ways, alternative ways of holding kids. Can you use a sling? Is that what that baby is used to? Is a parent who, who wears the baby in a sling? We, our girls were five and a half months and four and a half months when they came. So they were bigger. And we used a backpack all the time. We have pictures of me doing dishes with Elizabeth in the backpack. And Emily, oh, it was Elizabeth, I think, in the backpack on her father's back as he's using a, one of those uh, radial saws. <laughs> he was doing some construction. She, we just knew she wanted to be with us all the time. But we had a life, and we were doing other things. so. She was with us in a backpack. Um, we traveled with her. We had the backpack. Um, that way, then, she didn't fuss because she was with us. Um, and so thinking about how else can I do it that might reduce the crying and fussing and say to the child, I am right here. There was a mom who I met at the Common Ground Fair. She was an, an adoptive mom who had adopted a, a second child from Vietnam. They had adopted a little girl from China. Then for a son, they went to Vietnam. And I met them at um, Common Ground Fair. 
They had come home in, sep uh, in uh, late August. This was September. And um, she had him in a front pack. And he was facing out. And so we chatted, but I didn't get too close. I had not met this child. She introduced me, but I stayed my distance because, again, I'm not going to be intrusive and overwhelm him. So what I observed, though, was he kept banging his head like that. Not banging it, but he, he kept kind of pushing his head back. And she said to me, he keeps doing this all the time. And I said, oh, OK. I was just taking in observations. And so on Monday, when I went back to the adoption agency, I, I talked to the director, who was a social worker, and I said, you know, I don't think he likes being in that front pack facing out. Would it be OK for me to call the mom and have a conversation about, yes, keeping him in the pack, but turning him around? And she said, you know, fine, go for it. So I called the mom, and I said, you know, what I observed, and I just chatted with her, and I said, what I observed was your son was trying to get away from some of the stimulation, talk about stimulation, from all that happens at Common Ground Fair. And I would urge you to turn him around and see what happens, because then he can turn his face around when he wanted to, to see what was happening, but he could also get away from it. And she said, well, because he was probably eight or 10 months at the time, but tiny still. Um, she said, I didn't want him to miss anything because he's, I'm trying to make up for things that he hadn't had. And I said, well, he's got plenty of time and a family that will do those kinds of things with him. So she called back within a week and said, what a difference it makes. He's not banging his head on my collarbone. She said, but he does. He picks his, his head up and looks out, and then he'll kind of snuggle. And so it was those kinds of things. Talk about meeting a need and, and paying attention to those cues. Then, as he was more familiar with the sights and sounds of America, particularly the sounds, every sound is different. When you come from Vietnam, you have a different language, different smells, different. all that sensory stuff is different. So now he's got another whole sensory bath to be in that's very, very different. And it made a huge difference for him. And for the mom, she felt he was more relaxed and more comfortable. Then she could always turn him around as he got older and more comfortable with that. So for me, that was one of those just like, oh, this is what I perceived going on. I wasn't a social worker. And I always said at the agency, I'm not a social worker, but I know child development. And so that's when we get those cues it, it raises our sensitivity if we're willing to do that. So, other questions here? You haven't had a question. Do you have any questions? No. no. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'm looking forward to about 5.30, a Skype we think is going to come in from Pat, who is in Italy, if the train gets her from one city to the next. Um, and I know you have a break before that. So um, let's, well, I'll read a book, a short, a very short book first. Then we'll take a break, and then we'll be ready at 5.30. I'll keep going otherwise, but um, if this all works. And I'm not a technology person, so we'll see. So this book that I'm going to read you is called You Are My Perfect Baby. And think about babies and the messages that we can give them about being worthy for who they are. I happen to find this at an adoption conference. It's not an adoption book, but um, I found it there and I just loved it. So I bought it. It's by Joyce Carol Thomas. And I picked up a second one, had no idea it was by the same author. And I'll read that one to you later. But the pictures are by Nikita Bennett. What you're going to see on the babies in it are these red marks. We loaned it to a family friend, and the child put red marks on all the people. So that's just what it is. You are a perfect baby with perfect arms and perfect lips and tiny fingers and perfect hips. You are a perfect baby with dimples on your perfect knees with kicking legs I love to squeeze. 
You are a perfect baby with little cheeks and a perfect chin, shiny hair, and perfect skin. You are a perfect baby with perfect feet and twinkling toes, with tiny ears and a perfect nose. You are a perfect baby with perfect laughs lit up with joy. With perfect hands, you play your toy. You are a perfect baby with little wrists and wiggly waist, a little head and perfect face. You are my perfect baby. Do you hear the message there that that baby gets? Wouldn't it be fabulous if every baby got that same message? So let's get back to um, bonding and attachment. And thinking about that whole process of attachment and thinking about children and what is it that we do that is kind of the recipe for building strong, secure attachments. Because that's the goal, for children to have secure attachments. And we'll talk sh briefly in a bit about what's the benefit for children. But there are five things that adults do that builds a strong, secure attachment. And the first one is food and feeding. Because that's the survival. We feed children. We um, hopefully, babies are held when they are fed. Sometimes people think, oh, I've taught my baby to hold his or her own bottle, and I can prop them up and they can feed themselves. But what that does is it removes another one of the techniques of what our job is, which is skin-to-skin -skin contact. Because if you are feeding a baby, either breastfeeding or bottle feeding, you may be touching their hands. They may be curling their fingers around one of your fingers. They may lift their fingers to touch your face. You may be stroking them. You may be rubbing their head. It's skin-to-skin -skin contact. And if they are holding their bottle and they're propped up on pillows, they've totally missed that. And that is really significant. We each have a certain smell. And so that skin-to-skin -skin contact can teach children that also. Before they are, oh, six or eight months old, they know what mother smells like, which is different, probably around three or four months, different than dad, different than a sibling, different than a caregiver. So food and feeding, and thinking about that question previously about the child who, you know, if you're giving them a cookie, is that feeding them or is that um, spoiling, spoiling them? Food and feeding is, this is a need. And it's like, okay, yes, I will make sure you have a snack because you need a snack. I, I go in childcare centers and I see kids, oh, around 1130, melting down more, whining more, and just like, mm, they need to eat. And when they've had their lunch, then typically what happens is they wash up and then they take a rest. It's like they've gotten re-energized by eating lunch. But it's thinking about that spacing of food because it's one of those, if, I, if I'm hungry, I can't concentrate. We have now meals in schools for children, breakfast in school, lunch in school, snacks in school, after school sometimes. Because kids need that for their brains to be powered and their bodies to be powered. So they're thinking about something other than their stomach is empty and they're hungry. So food and feeding is our job. Another part of our job is that skin-to-skin -skin contact. The, the um, backpacks, the, the pouches, uh, the um, slings, that all gets the baby closer. We would talk to our pre-adoptive families about don't get one of those umbrella strollers that the baby is looking out at the world that they're already familiar with in Vietnam or China or whatever, they need to be looking at the world with you. 
And so it's that pack. If you can do that physically, child care centers, I remember being a teacher in an infant toddler center, I'd have one on the front and one on the back, and then a stroller that the babies were looking at us. So that I'd have two in a stroller and one on front, one on back. And then we could have conversation and, and they were touching my hair and touching my neck and doing those kinds of things so they knew that they were being cared for by the person who was their caregiver inside. So that's the second thing. The third thing is eye contact. And if you're feeding a baby, either breastfeeding or bottle feeding, again, eye contact. They can see about 10 inches right when they're born. So they can see you. And so if you're bottle feeding, then you have them up here. This distance isn't more than 10 inches probably, particularly if you have your head down and you're looking at them. This is, this is one of the things that I'm concerned about as I see young parents walking through the grocery store, reading their phones or texting on their phone, not paying attention to their child who's sitting in the seat, whether it's a baby seat or in the, the front of the grocery cart. Uh, you know, in the seat part of the grocery cart. It's that eye contact. It's saying, I am here for you. I'm connecting with you. Not talking about what do they see and what do they hear and how does the air feel and the air conditioning and those things. This eye contact says, I'm paying attention to you. And that's a way that we build that reciprocity back and forth. If I'm talking to you and I'm looking at you, then you know that it's important to look at me when we have conversation. They know that children at a very young age babble in conversation when they've been talked to. It's they babble, babble, and you say something, and then they babble, babble, and you say something else. They're beginning to get that conversation back and forth. That's building relationships. So there's eye contact, skin-to-skin -skin contact, and food and feeding. Humor and smiles. So we smile at each other, we get a sense of what amuses you, what do you think is funny, what do I think is funny. If a baby makes a funny noise and we laugh and it's just like, oh, did you hear that sound? And people speak in that um, motherese, they call it. It's known as that, you know, a different tone of voice and you have a high voice and babies pay attention to it. Um, it's what's funny in this family? Do we um, play jokes on each other? Do we use puns? Do we you know, tickle? Do, what is it? And how do we get each other to smile? Do we read funny books together? Do we you know, make rhymes? Do we whatever? Roll around on the floor? This is a way that I can feel connected to the other people in my family or the other people in the group if it's a child care group or whatever, by those humors and smiles. And the last thing is movement and rhythm. Movement and rhythm. In this group, in this family, in this um, gathering, how do people move? When I am a baby, am I jiggled up and down? Do I, sway, do I get swayed back and forth? How do I like it best? Some babies, I, I, there was a baby in childcare when I was a teacher, and he wanted to be belly down on your arm with his head in your hand and kind of up and down like this. That was hard after a while. You don't, you'd have to sit down because he was heavy. But that was the preference that he had, and he made it clear. Because if you tried to do something else, he would be one of these crying and fussing babies. So it's like, okay, if that's how you're more comfortable, I'll try to do that. With Emily, our second daughter, she, uh, we would take a walk, and she was a very slow walker. <laughs> and we, People have said to me all my life, wow, you walk fast. And I'd have to stop, and Emily would be halfway down the block, and I'd say, okay, Em, come on, I'm waiting for you. And what she might be doing, actually, is sitting on the ground, taking off her shoes and her socks, because her socks had a wrinkle in them. Or the seam on the top of the socks was bugging her. This is part of that um, tactile defensiveness that 
Emily came with that I had never heard of. Um, we suspect and might, we know that her birth mother did alcohol and some drugs while she was pregnant, so we knew there could very well be some alcohol effect, which I would guess maybe there is some. To this day, she will not go barefoot, and the, the socks that she gets have to have a certain depth of fuzz on the inside to be comfortable. Again, I never paid any attention to that. I just wore whatever socks I had. Didn't know they had seams. But there would be Emily back there, and so we'd let her get her shoes and socks back on, and then she'd come and meet us. But that was the rhythm in the household. Are you a family that, um, you know, you go out jogging. Some, you see parents sometimes, or adults sometimes, with children in those jogging strollers, or jogging, and they have the strollers. And that's what the child knows is the rhythm. There was a family who adopted a little girl from China, and um, they had two boys already. And the mom called us one day and said at the adoption agency, what do I do? She is just so slow doing everything. And we said, that's who she is. And she said, but can I send her to child care in her pajamas? And I said, well, call the child care. Because she was so slow in the morning, she couldn't get dressed. And if the mom tried to, there would be then a temper tantrum. It's not worth that. So she worked with the child care provider, and she said, I don't care if she comes in her jammies. And what happened is, when she got to childcare, she quickly got herself dressed, because she didn't want to be the only one in pajamas, but it would have been a hassle at home. See, that's meeting those needs rather than wants, and it's just like, okay, my mom was a kindergarten teacher. She said kids would come sometimes in their pajamas, but they quickly got themselves dressed, because they didn't want to be in their pajamas. So it's like, okay, that's that natural kind of consequence, um, but it's that rhythm. What is it like in your family? So as you look at these five things, does it bring up any parallel to adult behavior? Think about it. Anything come to mind? Well, I'll answer the question for you. And I'll hide it until I reveal the answer. Okay, here is the answer below the line. Oops, I gotta get my head out. There, thank you, Bill. What do you do when you're dating? You go out to eat, skin to skin contact, some kind or other, eye contact, find out what the other person thinks is funny and smiling, and move in a rhythm. There it is. And what are you doing when you're dating? You're choosing, or not, to form an attachment. Same thing. But we don't think of it that way when we're dating somebody. But you are choosing to engage with someone. And then, if you choose, well, this isn't going to work out, fine, you disengage and you go your separate ways. But you're doing all of these things as you get to know someone, as you're building a relationship. So if you think back to the bonding part, bonding is for adults, and I'm gonna call it a moment. It happens. Attachment, is for all children, adults, and it's over time. Because that attachment cycle happens thousands of times, thousands of times. If you think of all the interactions with a young child in a day, you know, it's just over and over and over again. Because what you're building is brain pathways that say, I'm worthy of care, and you are, wor you are trustworthy to meet my needs. I can trust you. But the brain has to build those pathways. So over time is attachment. So you're dating, and it's over time. 
And then sometimes people will say, if they choose to disengage, well, I didn't know he was really like that. Well, what of these didn't, didn't you explore while you were dating that person? You know, it's like, okay, there was some time, if it was a real hasty liaison, then maybe you didn't get to do all this and didn't really know who that person was. But over time, we build those attachments. Okay, so the last piece that I'm going to do is around the benefits of secure attachments. Why do this? And the first benefit for children, or for any of us as adults too, if you think of a partner, is that if we are attached, if the child is attached to us, the child has a sense of safety and security. So the world is a safe place. You will keep me safe. And children in foster care and some in adoption haven't had that message. The world hasn't been a safe place. The, safe, the world has been a scary place. Maybe yelling, maybe hitting, maybe hurting in all sorts of ways. So attachment to a new adult situation or in a new adult situation says, okay, I need to learn that it is a safe place. And sometimes I've heard people in childcare say, you're safe, you're safe. That's another one of those lines like, you're fine, you're okay. But that child may not know what safe feels like. And so to think about, okay, what's the environment and how can I give that message that you're safe? Um, with some of the foster kids that we had over the years, we were always outside when they were playing outside. So they would know we were there if they needed something. Um, we would make, we lived in Palmyra and um, had some acreage and so we would make paths through the woods, but we would paint blazes on the trees. They helped us do that. And we would talk about that's how you know how to get home. We had vests in the winter, t or in the fall, during hunting season. They didn't leave the house without a hunting vest on. And, I mean, all these things, strategies. We wore our seat belts. Um, we didn't smoke cigarettes. We talked about this one time. And the kids then would say to somebody when they saw them smoking, you know you're going to die from smoking. Because <laughs> we had brainwashed them that that's one way to keep your body safe, is not to smoke cigarettes. And one man at the town meeting in Palmyra said, you know, you're right. I just was like, oh my gosh, the messages you give children that come back to haunt you. But, um, but that safety and saying, I'm here to keep you safe. Um, the two brothers that we had in foster care, their parents had left them for five days by themselves. Three children. They were six, either six, seven, and eight or seven, eight, and nine. I don't remember exactly. This was a long time ago. And then the neighbor began to realize, because they were upstairs in an apartment, the kids hadn't gone to school and nobody had come and gone. So it was like, ooh, what is going on? And then they called the, the police, who then called the social worker. Five days, kids on their own at a very young age. They, who was keeping them safe? Nobody was there. So we did a lot of conversation around safety and yes, we are right here and this is what you do. Anyway, it's, it's a, a perception of the world as safe and secure. Secondly, secure attachments teach me that I can trust you to help me out if I needed something. One of the little boys we had for a relatively short time he, would, he was getting in trouble in school. And we'd say, when somebody is bothering you, go to the teacher. His response to us was, the teacher won't do anything. So we went to the school and had a conversation about that. And we developed a circle around the duty teacher that he could play in to begin with. So he knew he was safe. It's meeting that need. So then, he could begin to do stuff that he should have been doing, playing with kids, but he didn't think it was safe. 
And he was known as Bad Billy, because there was Good Billy in his classroom as well. You know, it's like, oh. And he was in first grade. Um, but if I trust you, then you can trust me. And when you said, how do you know that they're telling you the truth? You don't always know that. And kids who haven't had enough to eat are going to say, no, I haven't had a snack. And they'll take another snack. A man named Greg Keck, he's done a lot of work around attachment. He's out in Ohio. <clears throat> he adopted a boy in his early teens. And he said, around our house, we had 100 boxes of Kraft macaroni and cheese, you know, those blue boxes. And he said, we did that so he would know there always was going to be food and that it was okay by me that we had 100 boxes all around the house so that he knew that I was providing that for him. It's that reciprocity back and forth. He could trust me to feed him because he hadn't always had that. But he did know how to make that, that macaroni and cheese. So we, Greg said, okay, that's what I got. 100 boxes of that. But it worked. It was a, a concrete way of that child getting, oh, okay, you can, I mean, you're there for me. Um, wasn't easy sledding, but it worked. The third thing that happens is, that's a positive thing for children with secure attachments is, they dare to explore the environment, because you're there. If they fall down, I mean, it, it's like you're there with the ice pack if they need it, or the Band-Aid, or the hug and the kiss. It's thinking about, okay, how can this child believe that I really am there for them? There's a paragraph in here, again, I wanted to read about these developmental stages and this exploring, exploring the environment. Just hang on a second. Here we are. Yes. Um, one hypothesis about this believing in the ability to explore the environment is that the child who is securely attached at one year becomes the competent toddler and preschooler. A number of studies support this. In one study, for example, two-year-olds who were securely attached as infants were more compliant, enthusiastic, and persistent in solving problems. And people talk about two-year-olds as the terrible twos. It isn't actually twos. It's two and a half. They get really challenging at two and a half. But if already they feel more compliant, enthusiastic, and persistent in solving problems, you're further along the road. And if we can then treat them that way, then we have fewer problems. Um, at age three and a half, which is, again, one of those tough times, these same children were more socially competent with peers than children who had not been securely attached infants. So it carries on. Now we're looking at social relations. At age four and five, children with secure attachment histories have been observed to be more confident and socially competent in peer relations than children who were anxiously attached. So it's that world is out there, and do I dare to go there? What we do know about adoptive parents is, and I will say I'm one of them, is that we worry about something happening to our children. We went through a lot to have those children join our family. And at nine, Emily said to me, Mom, you don't have to hold my hand in a parking lot anymore. I can do it myself. And I'm like, oh, OK, Emily. I wasn't feeling great and secure. And parking lots still scare me. I'm always looking around like, where's the car coming from? But she was able to say to me, I'll be fine in a parking lot. Just let go of my hand. She's had a serious accident, actually. And now she wants me on her right side because she, can't, she doesn't have any vision in that eye anymore. And she'll say, I'm really glad you're there holding my eye because <laughs> she can bang into things by accident. So it's kind of we come full circle. But she knows she can keep her world safe if I'm on that side. And she's developmentally there. You know, so it's like, but I, I remember that conversation like, OK, Emily, all right. So you'll be safe, and you can be on your own in a parking lot. But it's things like teaching kids how to cross the street. 
You know, if you teach them that, then they'll feel the world is safe. The fourth thing, develop the ability to self-regulate. Self-regulate is how do I take care of myself, knowing when I need to go to the bathroom, knowing when I am hungry, knowing when I'm tired, those kinds of things. I can put myself to sleep. Kids who are securely attached dare to go to sleep because they know you'll be there in the morning. Emily, again, had a lot of anxieties growing up. And by the time she came to us in our family at four and a half months, we were her fifth family. So she had been bounced and bounced and bounced five times to us. She had no sense of consistency and safety and all that. And so she didn't sleep through the night until she was almost four years old. So every night she'd go, Mommy, Mommy. And I'd say, I'm right across the hall. I'm, I need to see you. It was like her brain couldn't hold on to that picture enough to allow herself to go back to sleep. She didn't want water. She didn't want to be read to or anything. She just wanted me to, to, she wanted to see me. Once in a while, she'd come into our room and she'd be standing right next to me and I'd wake up because there she was. She'd say, I just needed to see you, mommy. And she'd take herself back to bed. But four years, every night, she woke herself up or woke up. But it was, she couldn't hold on to that yet. And when she, her brain was able to, she slept through the night. And I remember waking up thinking, oh my gosh, is Emily all right? Because parents do that at the beginning. They go in and see if the baby's still breathing kind of stuff. We get used to that. But it took Emily a long time to self-regulate that way. She needed to be held a lot longer. She didn't walk upstairs for whatever reason. I don't know what issue she had with walking upstairs or downstairs. She'd walk up, but she didn't walk down until she was probably three, and I would have to carry her. Because she would stand upstairs. I'd be at the foot, and I'd say, come on, Emma, I'm right here. No, Mommy, you have to carry me down. It wouldn't have done either one of us any good for me to say, well, I'm walking off. That would have reinforced the message, I'm not going to be there for you. So I'd go upstairs and carry her down, and then she'd carry on. I mean, she was fine. She's, I don't mean to picture her or describe her as this disturbed child. She just had different needs because her needs had not been met. So it took her a lot longer to self-regulate. And so it was like, what? I mean, she... It wouldn't have done either one of us any good in the middle of the night either if I didn't just go in and say, I'm right here, Em. Here's your blanket. Cover up. Okay. Um, but again, it's responding to other people and saying, well, that's who she is. Okay. Um, another one is it forms a foundation for personal identity. I see myself as worthy, as capable, as a problem solver, as confident. I have supports that tell me I'm a good person. I'm okay. And yes, I have needs and I, you know, it's like, but I'm a good person. Everybody doesn't always have that. Children don't always have that. There are children in, in Penelope, Penelope is my granddaughter's class, who will say, oh, I can't do that. And I'll look at them and I'll say, of course you could do that. Now let's break that down. Of course you can do that. And we break it down and I'll say, you solved that problem. You got it. Her teacher talks about learned helplessness. And that doesn't do any good when we do things for children. They're not developing that sense of, of skill, of being capable. People used to say, oh, you make your kids do too much. I was thinking the other day that Elizabeth, one of our family patterns was, if you left your clothes on your bedroom floor, I didn't pick them up and put them in the dirty laundry. That was your job. And if you didn't do your job, then I wouldn't have those clothes to wash. So at nine, I taught Elizabeth how to use the washing machine because whatever was in the laundry, I would wash. But I wasn't going in her bedroom and picking it up. So at a very young age, she knew how to use the washer. 
it's like, okay, now you have that skill. And so she could say, oh, yeah, I do my own laundry. Okay. And I base things on skills. You can ride your bike around the block when I know you have the skill to stay on the sidewalk and come back when you say you're going to come back. You know, it's like, okay. It's thinking about then saying you've got that skill. It doesn't matter if you're 10 or you're 6 doing it. If you've got the skill, you kind of pass the test, so to speak. And then you get the privilege of whatever that is. Um, but it's thinking about forming an identity that I am a worthy person. I grew up in a family of five kids. I never thought my parents would ever leave me. I just, I, it wasn't even in my thought process. When I went to summer camp, I knew they'd come pick me up. I mean, I just, it was a given. I never thought about it. When our daughter Elizabeth went to summer camp, the overnight camp, her counselor said by midweek she was beginning to kind of crumble around the edges, she called it, kind of getting more homesick and just having a really hard time. On the Saturday that we went to pick her up, because it was from Sunday to Saturday, on Saturday she was the first child packed and out on the hill, they called it, waiting for the family, for us to come. And it was from um, Waterville to Bridgeton, which is a good distance. And we weren't one of the first families there. And she was like panicked that we weren't coming. And I'm thinking, why would you think that? My frame of reference is different than hers. And so because she was not parented by her birth mom, she knows what it is not to be kept in the words of kids, my birth mom didn't keep me. So she knows what that experience is. And it's like, oh, that's part of her identity. Like, oh, I wasn't good enough to be kept. So are you going to leave me as well? So it's, it's a different way of seeing who we are. Um, seven is that we build core beliefs about ourselves, others, and life. If I can't trust adults to meet my needs, then is life going to be like that all along? Is it like, uh, I don't know, I'm always going to be worried about things, I'm not going to have enough, and it's that sense of security. So myself, can I trust a boyfriend? Can I trust a girlfriend? Can I trust friends? Are they going to leave me? So it's all that wrapped up into this belief about life and other people and myself. Then it's a, we know it's a defense against stress. A secure attachment is a defense against stress in that um, we believe that others will support us through hard times. When I mentioned M had an accident. She was in Maine Med for two weeks, and we were there 24 hours a day. It was a stressful situation. It was a serious accident. She would open her eyes, and she would say, oh, you're right there. And I'd say, yep, we're right here. And she'd go back to sleep. And she said to me afterwards, I knew that you or Daddy would be there all the time. And we were. We took shifts. Um, my mom came down. Grammy was there. We had um, two friends. We would tag team each other. And we were all, one of us was always there and one of these other people. So there were always two people at her bedside the entire time. And I believe it really did help speed her recovery enough to leave the hospital because she could sleep. I knew one of you would always be there. We know children who are in stressful situations, like going to the doctor can be stressful. If a, a somebody to whom they are attached is with them, they do better. They've done um, research around the child going into the doctor with a parent, the child going in with a friend, the child going in with a stranger. They do much better and what they're measuring is cortisol. It's a hormone, 
and the more cortisol we the more stressed we are the more cortisol we produce and so they can test this out of saliva so it's easy it's not very invasive and so they know that children under stress produce more cortisol adults do too so if you have a partner a family member or somebody to whom you're attached with you you do better under stressful situations so it's a great defense and lastly um, hypervigilance is reduced and I mentioned the cortisol less cortisol is produced cortisol over time is damaging for our bodies it damages organs it's it's not healthy for us and so hypervigilance is reduced when we are with somebody to whom we are attached and so that's a positive if you think of um, somebody who was abused as a child they may be an adult and they are hyper vigilant um, victims of domestic violence are hyper vigilant they're producing cortisol a lot more when there's somebody to whom they are attached with them that cortisol is not produced as much and it it um, helps with the production uh, with the stress less cortisol um, the um, there was one last little section here oh right here that um, oh no sorry it's around the um, here we are um, children who are anxious Oh, I'll go back a little bit. Interesting differences exist between children who have secure versus anxious attachments. Anxious attachments are not, not as helpful for children. The, the children don't feel that connection in the same way at all to the adult. With um, resistant ones, they just they really don't care about the adult. They are not getting what they need from the adult. Um, and avoidance, there's resistant and avoidance. Um, children with secure earlier attachments are more likely in later years to be better problem solvers because you can take a risk form friendships be leaders with peers be more empathetic think about that one be more empathetic their needs are met so they can meet the needs of others engage their world with confidence have higher self-esteem be better at resolving conflict and more self-reliant and adaptable. All those things come about when we feel better about ourselves, we see ourselves as more competent. Um, yesterday, Penelope in her classroom, I was like, yes, that's my granddaughter. They were doing robot making with Legos and her group, with Penelope as the leader, I would say, got their robot to make sound and to turn circles and to kick away tires I mean it was like very exciting and the whole class came and watched it's like wow she's got a lot of self-confidence and her teacher needed to remind her though that other children could have a turn too because she takes over a little bit but so those are all secure attachments. in contrast children with anxious attachments are more likely in later years too be socially withdrawn from peers they don't know whether they can trust them or not are they going to be there for me or not be overly dependent on adults there's one little boy in her class who constant well I can't say constantly that's an exaggeration but multiple times in my morning in that classroom he goes to hug the teacher I'm thinking okay he's in third grade but it's like he's a very young child who needs constant reassurance that he's okay uh, I don't know the history of these kids but he has lower self-confidence for sure he can victimize or be victimized by peers I heard the teacher say to him yesterday you need to speak up when you want to turn he doesn't speak up forms fewer friendships and is less emotionally healthy these behaviors predicted earlier fit theories of attachment well attachment theory preliminary research also supports predictions about a person's ability to provide high or low quality parenting 
So if, as a child, we haven't experienced secure attachment, do we have the knowledge and skill to do that for our children? Because we don't know what it is. And it's that multi-generational thing that can happen in families. If there's trauma, if there's postpartum depression, if there's challenging things happening, if that bottom, that foundation is falling apart, then it's hard for us to pass that on to our children. I was always concerned about foster children that we had and whether, when they grew up, what kind of parents they would be because they'd had such traumatic beginnings. Children who were in the foster care system, I've kind of narrowed it down to they, there has to be broken bones or blood, really, for them to be removed from those families. And if we as a society don't put enough services into those families, if the children are going to stay there, how are things going to change? There was one research um, report that they talked about, though, that was very encouraging. When they had home visiting in um, families, uh, they had 46 visits in a year into families that had issues around parenting. Here we are. Um, maternal factors have also been examined. Sensitivity to secure infant, um, oh, they link maternal sensitivity to secure infant mother attachment. We talked about that sensitivity about paying attention to cues. In one of the studies, researchers were able to predict quality of attachment on the basis of observation of maternal sensitivity with 94% accuracy. That is incredible. But by watching mothers with babies, they could predict that sensitivity to 94% accuracy. In a study of infants at social risk due to poverty, maternal depression, and caregiving inadequacy, researchers showed that developmentally oriented home visitation had a significant impact on these at-risk infants. Maine has a home visiting program. Home visits averaged 46 visits over a span of 13 months. So more than three per month. The home visited infants were twice as likely to be classified as having secure attachments to their mothers as infants in a matched sample who were not visited. Additionally, the home visited infants scored an average of 10 points higher on a test of infant mental development, the Bailey mental scale they used, than non-visited infants. So 10 points higher on a test of mental development and secure attachment. Fabulous benefits for working on attachment with children. So, questions within this group or anybody out there? Okay. I'm going to read I'm going to finish by reading two books, actually. I brought a second one. Um, we've talked about bonding and attachment. I've mentioned foster care and adoption. We've talked about, well, if you think, the one piece that I, I haven't said is, if you think of children with special needs, a child, Emily actually was diagnosed as being deaf when she was, she would have been about six months. She was not, but we had to have tubes put in. They put tubes in and she could hear. But I remember thinking the first diagnosis, how are we going to do this? How are we going to teach her to talk? My husband's a professor at the university too. So it's like, okay, we talk, talk, talk all the time. So this child needs to learn how to talk. 
And to, it's that to be connected in our family, you have to talk. So how are we going to do that? But that kind of an experience, if it hadn't been um, remediated, as it was, would the, we knew that that would slow down her development. She also was able to sleep for 20 minutes and then wake up because she didn't hear anything. So she would just have these little cat naps. So I didn't think that was great for her body to have rest time like a more typical baby. So there were those kinds of challenges that I saw coming up and that could impact her development and how would we parent her. I didn't have those skills. And so it's thinking about whatever challenges a child comes with, whether it's through the foster care system, whether it is from being placed as an infant or an older child into the adoption world, coming from another culture, um, a child who has a physical challenge, a child with a cognitive challenge, a child with an eating challenge, whatever it is, how is that going to change that attachment cycle? And are we going to be able to work on those things? Um, a mom in an adoption conference talked about adopting a girl from Romania. Now, you young folks don't remember this, but you might, Megan. Um, when Ceausescu was overthrown in Czechoslovakia, uh, in Romania, sorry, in Romania, they discovered many, many orphanages were in existence, which they didn't know about, children with special needs or children who um, the family already had too many children and so they placed a child in this orphanage. There were rooms, crib, 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 regardless. I mean, they, there was no stimulation. They had nowhere near enough caregivers. There were sometimes two or three children in a crib. They were fed from bottles where the, the nipples had larger holes in them and they would put cereal in them so the children were getting the cereal through the, the formula and they were just feeding themselves with these bottles. No human contact other than to like change diapers. Um, so anyway, this mom went, a lot of Americans, a lot of people around the world went to Romania and adopted this child knowing that there were going to be challenges, but she didn't know how many challenges. And what they found was children were really frightened of new things and of adults because they hadn't had experience with them. And she showed a video of the child sitting on one end of the couch and the mom was on the other end. The child refused to be held, to be fed. And she had her own bottle. And the mom said, I knew that I couldn't hold her and feed her because she wasn't ready for that yet. So what you saw was the mom beginning to make those overtures. The child would say down there, and here's the mom. She, the mom, you could see the mom kind of trolling her hand down and just touching the girl's foot, and then she'd pull her hand back. And then she'd kind of sneak it down again, and she'd touch and she'd pull it back. It became a game. So then you saw the little girl putting her foot out. It's that touch, that skin-to-skin -skin contact, but then she'd pull it back. It became smiles, humor, skin-to-skin -skin contact while she was still feeding herself. And her mom said she was probably four when she did this workshop at this conference. Um, she never was able to hold the child's bottle. The child wouldn't give it up because that was survival. She said, and by four, she was able to eat yogurt, uh, yogurt, vanilla pudding, you're getting a sense of the foods, very soft, things with no texture because she could just swallow it. She hadn't learned yet to have food with texture in her mouth because of the feeling of it. It was a sensation. But she said, we've made great progress. Now we can walk along hand in hand. So. It's those things that people could face as they're parenting someone who has issues around attachment. She thought she'd made great progress. Oh, she would drink milk out of a cup, yogurt, pudding. There was something else, a foot. But it was all like white food, too, you know, white color. 
No, no, too much texture. There was a, a video, that some um, occupational therapist from Boston University went over, and they were going to do some therapy with some of these kids. And they put a piece of blueberry cake in front of a child. And the child barely touched it. And then it was like they were burned, and they turned their body. They were in a, like a child seat. They turned their body away because it was so adversive for them. They couldn't believe it. It was cake. And usually kids would at least play with it. No way. Um, there was one child that they said was doing better in this particular orphanage. And they didn't know why. But it was a child at the end of a line of cribs. And then there was a door that went out of the room. Like an entry door was here, all these cribs, and then out there was another door. And so they put up a camera, a video camera, because they, they wanted to know why is this child doing better than other children. And what they saw was at night, a woman would come in to mop the floors, and she would mop up and down all these rows of cribs. And when she got to the end before she left the room, she would stop and pick up that child was talking to that one child, and it made a difference in how he reacted to people because he'd had that experience. They couldn't believe it. It was the maid or the cleaning woman who was making a difference in that child. They also saw, and some of these videos are interesting. They're probably on YouTube now, but um, the children, when somebody would come in, they'd all stand up and look like this. And they call it the orphan salute. And they thought, what is going on? But what they were doing was blocking the light, they figured, so that they could see who was coming in the room. An adaptive behavior that worked for those children. So it's like, hmm, interesting. So a lot of families have adopted those children and have gone on to have some real challenges because kids didn't have that attachment experience. And it's hard. It's hard to do some of those things. It doesn't mean you can't, but it's a long road. So you're creating situations in America for families whose children then are identified with behavioral issues, integration, uh, sensory integration issues, attachment issues, those kinds of things. So anyway, I brought a book called I Love You When. And I'd like to read this one, then finish with that joy. And so we'll get out a few minutes early, which I'm sure you're not going to worry about. I Love You When by Ann, Annie Baker. I love you when it's warm and sunny. I love you when you're being funny. You see him in a carrot over here. I love you when it's wet outside. I love you when you want to hide. That always reminds me of the runaway bunny. Some of you might know that book in childhood. I love you when it's very breezy. I even love you when you're sneezy. I love you when we rush to and fro, and I love you when there's nowhere to go. I love you when you're feeling sleepy. I love you when you're sad and weepy. I love you when you giggle, when you wiggle, when you wriggle. I love you when you're snuggly. I love you when you're hugly. I love you when you say, I love you too. But mostly, I love you whenever I'm with you. It's that reassurance that is so fabulous for children, that they're loved just who they are, where they are, and how they are. And the last one I'm going to read is Joy by Joyce Carol Thomas, same author as the perfect baby one. Pictures this time by Pamela Johnson. And again, just think of the message that comes across to a child. You are my joy. In every season, summer, fall, winter, spring, 
You touch my heartstrings. You are my joy. You are my joy freed in the whippoorwill's wing, heard in the tall grass that sings, in the laughter that rings from the sunny side of porches. You are my joy snug in a scarf and jacket, rolling in leaves, spun from autumn trees in a yard lit by sunset. You are my joy lulled by the sound of icicle chimes and water rhymes, tap dancing on sidewalks. You are my joy pointing at rainbows, circling the earth as it gives birth to flowers. You are my joy in every season, summer, fall, winter, spring. You make my heart sing. You are my joy. So thank you for your attention this afternoon. And as you look at and work around children, with children, think about what are they getting from me from this particular interaction. The children in Sarah's group, why are they crying and fussing? How can the caregivers best meet their needs? And her words about using non-confrontational words, it might be talking about your understanding of what attachment is about and how that serves children to be secure and do the development that they need to do. So good luck, Sarah and all the rest of you, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>